What's going on, everybody? It's Saul Sunforge for Dungeons and Taverns. How's everybody doing? Happy Halloween. I'm getting ready to take my daughter trick or treating, but beforehand, I wanted to make you a video. It's been a while since we released the monster videos, you know, for the different CRs for different level parties, monsters that typically aren't uh, used too much. At least they're not overused like uh, a lot of typical monsters are. So we are on levels 16 through 20. So, you know, those, each of those levels, it's, since it's the last tier of play, each of those levels is very special. And really, you could do, you know, the three or four monsters for each one of those levels. Um, you know, and maybe make a video of, of 16, 20 monsters for sure. But we're going to go ahead and limit it down to two monsters per level and a bonus monster that um, you can use as henchmen perhaps instead of the uh, a boss man because uh, monsters in that level are beastly they're not as beastly in fifth edition as they were in past editions but they are beastly and you can do things to to ramp them up and i've made videos to show you how and i will make more videos to show you how so stay tuned to my channel follow me and let's get going these monsters are all going to be from the, the original monster manual for 5th edition, however. I am going to make a separate video uh, or chain of videos with monsters from the additional supplemental manuals, uh, the official content only, um, you know, the official source books, uh, none, none of the modules though, um, because those are all specially specific monsters. And uh, you guys just, you know, don't, might not have those things for sure and it's not worth purchasing a module just for you know a few monsters or something like that unless you're a dm and you're planning on running those modules so just to show that i have the book here's the official book it's real <laughs> just for lawsuit purposes because the websites that i use to show you the things online that are in this book um may not be official um, you know, so I do own the source material. I don't just, you know, jack it off the internet. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. I'm leaving that in. Okay. Continuing. All right. So for level 16, we have on page 170, of the monster manual, we have the iron golem. Here are the golems. Um, the stone golem is only CR 10 and we haven't included that in the list. Uh, that's a good golem to have. Uh, all the golems are really sweet. They're constructs, right? They're uh, almost always going to be large constructs or huge or gargantuan or, you know, something like that. You could play with those as a DM to, to do anything to the stats. The stat, the official stat blocks, just so you understand and be to be clear, you don't have to use the official stat blocks for any of these. You can change them. You can even change the stone golem to have a higher CR. You just have to do a lot to it. But the iron golem already made is CR 16. So that means a party of four with no magic items. That's appropriate challenge rating for them. Now in D&D 5th edition, the challenge ratings get a little bit wonky after about a CR 10. And that's just because they, it, it can't account for player experience, you know, your party size, your DM's experience, uh, magic items, um, you know, things like that, how well you can play your class. Um, so these CRs, you know, obviously you could do things to, to adjust them, like I said. You could do it in combat even, uh, you know, you can always go high, you know, and then, you know, if you see how it goes and then go low. Um, you can always do that in your adjustments. You don't want to ever adjust from low to high because then your party is going to feel screwed. That's just human nature. That's the way it is. But the, the Iron Golem is all armor. It's natural armor. It's AC 20, which is pretty high. Um, you know, if you have a, say you have a plus eight to hit, you still need to roll a 12 or higher to hit. And look at all these damage immunities. They're immune to fire, poison, psychic, bludgeoning, piercing and slashing from non-magical weapons that aren't adamantine and then they have conditional immunities they can't be charmed they can't be exhausted they can't be frightened they can't be paralyzed or petrified or poisoned 
So that covers quite an extensive list of the player's most common uh, elementals or status effect attributes. Um, they have dark vision out to 120 feet, but they are kind of they you know they're kind of dumb. They can't perceive everything around them very well, so their passive isn't that great. So your players can sneak up on them, and you know it can make an amazing battle. I can imagine a, a vault like a king's vault. Uh, or you know some some undead pharaoh, uh, his vault being guarded by these iron golems in the front, you know, and they don't they don't activate, they don't activate until something happens. A trap is tripped, the door is unsuc unsuccessfully unlocked, um, you know, through lock failed lock picking attempt, um, you know. Uh, you could do a whole bunch of things if the party is, you know, standing up and the golem, it's in their vision, and you could you could do that. It would play into their passive perception being super low. So if the party for some reason says they 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 want to sneak in, well then the golems don't activate, and that's a cool way around the, that fight. The party had no idea that that was the plan, but they you know ironically successfully passed the challenge. Because, you know, you didn't tell them ahead of time. You can tell them after if you want to, but I don't advise revealing what's behind the curtain. Too often, anyway. I do sometimes, but it's it's hard. It's hard when you're excited. Oh my god, I'm keeping that one in, too. Alright, well, enough with the unintentional sexual innuendos. Let's go look at some of their other abilities. Fire absorption. When the golem is subjected to fire damage, it takes no damage and instead regains a number of hit points equal to the fire damage dealt. A lot of experienced players will know that the golem has that ability. Okay? And so if they intentionally start to fight or whatever, and they're like, you know, beware of, you know, don't cast any fire spells or things like that, that's, met, that's what... That's an example of metagaming, right? But they can send you a message and ask, would my character know, blah, 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 based off of their intelligence or their level or, you know, if they fought it before, you know, their research and game, you know, things like that, they may. And so then, yeah, of course, you could let them know in secret, and then it's up to them to use their free action to speak real quick to the people around them. But the golem, look at that slam attack. It has a plus thirteen to its slam. If you have a if you have a squishy caster whose AC is only like fifteen, that golem only has to roll a two. And they get two slam attacks, right? So even even if um you know if their AC is less than fifteen, they're definitely in trouble. Uh you know, you you can't you can't hit on a natural one, um, but you know. So I guess fifteen would be the lowest. What am I talking about? Sorry, I'm tired. They they have a five foot reach, but they could also have a sword attack that has a ten foot reach, and it does more it does more damage. It has the same to hit, and they also have a poison breath. You know, it recharges whenever you roll a six each round that you don't expel that poison breath at the start of the round, you roll to uh, see if you have the the recharge or whatever. Uh, you know, and I've seen DMs do it at the end of the round or the beginning of the round, and yeah, it makes a little bit of a difference, but essentially it doesn't. Not after, you know, uh, it's just really, you know, like a matter of turn order. But yeah, I always have it recharge, uh, you know, on their turn. Uh, and so if they're highest on the initiative, it's at the beginning of the round. And then if they're lowest on the initiative, they get it at the end of the round. And, you know, I do that because I like to give monsters, you know, sometimes legendary actions uh, that the players won't expect that monster to have because my players are experienced players uh, mostly, you know, multiple years. And so you want to throw surprises at them. The bonus um, CR-16 monster that you're going to get is the Merilith, and they are on page 61 of the monster manual. The Merilith is essentially a female snake demon with multiple arms and swords for, uh, in each arm. 
Um, they don't have, I mean, their movement speed is surprisingly fast for, for a snake. Um, snakes can move fast, though, in real life. They, they can, but most of them are not. But this isn't real life. So this snake moves at 40 feet per, per round, and that is going to be uh, faster slightly or matching, depending on feats and things like that, your party's speed, unless your party they have boots of haste and things like that to negate that. So you're not going to be able to really run from this creature. Uh, and then, like I said, she has um, she has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. And her weapon attacks are magical. And she gets to take uh, one reaction on every turn in combat. Um, and then she has, uh, what is it, four? Oh, no, no. It's seven attacks. It's seven attacks. I thought it was four. She makes seven attacks, okay? And they are a little bit, you know, they're not as likely to hit as the golem, but the golem only had two attacks, right? He, he has a higher chance to hit, but he only gets two attacks. She has a little bit lower chance to hit, but she gets seven attacks. Uh, six with its long swords and then one with its tail. Uh, so she has a plus nine to hit, so that means if your AC is 20, she has, to, she has to roll an 11 or above to hit you. Thankfully, her range is only 5 feet, so the players aren't going to be dealing with these long swords you know, further out. But as a DM, if you want to, to force the issue, you can increase it to 10 feet if you want. That's for free. So the tail does also plus 9. It reaches 10 feet. Let's make it 15. One creature hit, uh, it hits one creature. Okay, so the tail isn't able to hit multiple creatures. You could make it so it could. It's up to you. It's up to your player's skill. And do you see that how these things all affect the challenge ratings, right? And then as a reaction, uh, she gets to add uh, a parry ability, which adds plus five to her AC. Um, and <clears throat> so if attack would hit, would hit, uh, the Merlith must see the attacker in wielding a melee weapon uh, in order to use the reaction to parry. Um, and, and so, you know, it depends on if you're playing on a grid, if you're playing with hexes or squares, and your movement, how it works, and things like that. But you don't have to worry about that as a player. That's for the DM. Uh, you know, if you do facing, you know, your, your uh, monster is facing a certain way. Um, you might even, you know, if they have shields and things, you might even do so they have that only that plus two AC only on their shield side, things like that. And then they can teleport uh, along with anything they're wearing or carrying up to 120 feet to an unoccupied space it can see. So I can see you making one of these Merilis, giving them magical abilities, okay? And then they're teleporting around. And you could do different things, like you could have a room that the party's in where the wall, the walls, um, you know, a, a column comes down smashing every once in a while. But the, that's, they're not going to get smashed. Well, they might get smashed. Uh, and, you know, you, you want to be fair about it and not make the wall randomly smash in different places. Or you could, but you have to roll, you know, roll the dice to make it fair. So you can have the wall moving along a horizontal uh, axis while it's coming down and at whatever number you roll is how many rows you go before the wall comes down again you could do that but the point is the wall isn't intentionally made to smash them the wall is made to separate them so you're separating the party up and you can have henchmen and things coming in through doors on each section or something like that uh, or you can have, you know, the doors appear. The Merilith is safe on the other side. It makes doors appear so that each group has a few enemies to fight. Remember, when the group is separated, they're going to be w significantly weaker than if they're together because they can't synergize correctly when they're separated. That's why DMs always say, don't separate the party. Now, this creature on page 281, the Andro Sphinx, which is basically... Um, a male lion with wings there. They're celestial. 
and they're lawful, lawful neutral, and they're large. They can fly, and they can you know have a regular movement speed. Um, they fly faster than they walk, which makes sense. Usually, that's the way it is in D and D for flying creatures. They have a 17 AC, but you see that they're lawful neutral. So, what you may want to do is have them like as a like a fallen sphinx, because sphinxes they guard certain areas, right? Um, for whatever reason, they, they have a master, they have a purpose, it's a divine purpose usually, and they guard these areas. But what if that Sphinx was, their will was dominated, uh, and they were corrupted, um, you know, by a, a, a lich, let's say, or, or a demon, a de that would be, that would be even better. Liches are like the, you know, like they're cool and everything, but I think they are maybe overused a bit, but demons are overused even more so you really it's up to you but you can have them like controlled or something like that uh if your party is all pure good uh players you know their their alignment um <clears throat> but you know you can have the sphinx guarding somewhere that they're trying to go and you can have an npc maybe trick the party into going somewhere where that it's actually sacred and holy and the party th goes in thinking they're about to uh, they're about to you know kill some baddies, and um, you know they're tricked essentially into fighting uh, a lawful neutral uh, Andro Sphinx. There's a female version called the Gyna Sphinx, but I think she's like CR eleven or twelve or something. Um, this bad boy is a CR seventeen. He speaks Common and Sphinx. Uh, he has True Sight. Up to 120 feet. He can't be charmed. He can't be frightened. He's immune to psychic damage. Bludging, piercing, and slashing from non-magical damage. You'll see that this is a common reoccurring theme in higher level CR creatures. Is that they can't be, uh, they can't be, you know, fully damaged. Uh, you know, uh, according to certain things. Uh, you know, usually it's like the, the certain weapon types that are non-magical they'll either not be able to damage them at all or it will just be half damage depending on if it's a resistance or an immunity um, so the sphinx is immune to um, any effects that would sense its emotions or read its thoughts as well as any divination spell that it refuses um, wisdom insight checks made to ascertain the sphinx's intentions or sincerity have disadvantage so they're pretty hard to fool essentially their AC is only a 17, and I say only kind of ironically, but these higher level um, creatures are all going to tend to have a higher AC. That just has to happen, because if they're lower AC, then you have to give them even more offensive abilities. And a lot of them, as you can see already, have quite a few. But you can see that they have spells, uh, first to sixth level, uh, they make two. They can make two claw attacks, but those aren't the interesting things necessarily. We've encountered things with claws with two attacks. We've encountered things with spell levels. What's interesting is their roar. They can roar three times a day, and each time they roar it has a different effect. The first roar, each creature that fails a DC 18 wisdom saving throw is frightened for a minute. A frightened creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. The second roar... Each creature that fails a DC 18 wisdom throw is deafened and frightened for a minute. A frightened creature is paralyzed and can repeat the saving throw at the end of its turns, ending the effect on itself once they roll a success. So the DC is 18. That's pretty high, especially if you're going after the tanky classes. They tend to maybe not have wisdom. That might be one of their, you know, that might be one of their dump stats. Although usually people use intelligence as dump stats because it's not as beneficial in 5th edition as it is in previous editions, like 3.5, for example. However, my next campaign, I'm going to do something about that. Stay tuned to find that out. The third and final roar is uh, each creature makes a DC 18 constitution saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes 44, that's the average, or 8d10 thunder damage and is knocked prone. On a successful save, the creature takes half the damage still, and they're not knocked prone. If you notice, the con the save changed from Wisdom to Constitution. So, as a DM, 
an, an intelligent sphinx, and their intelligence is 16, so they have a plus 3 bonus, so they're pretty dang intelligent, you know. They'll, they'll know to use that third roar, um, and, you know, they're going to try to focus a caster, even if the caster teleported away or something like that, because the creatures can be within 500 feet. And if there's an occasion where, you know, some uh, caster is trying to, you know, shadow step, face step, you know, away, um, you know, the Sphinx can still get them. And the casters tend to have less constitution unless you're, you know, an eight pack wielding wizard, which you might be, which is actually a pretty cool idea now that I think about it. One final thing to note about the Sphinx is that they have legendary actions already built in. And some of those actions, depending on how devastating they are, or effective, if you will, um, cost a different amount of actions. So they get three of those per round. Um, a claw attack is it's just a basic single claw attack. It costs one point. You could teleport, which costs two points. They can teleport along with any other equipment up to 120 feet to an occupied space that it can see. So if that wizard or bard or rogue or whoever is trying to run away from the battle, that sphinx can teleport if they need to and then use their roar. If somehow, in some situation where somebody could get up to 620 feet away from that sphinx, which is a huge distance to cover. Most battle maps aren't going to be that. They're just, they're just not. There's, no, there's not enough room. There's not enough real estate for that. So if they didn't make it to the edge of the board, they're not safe. The only thing that is that players can't abuse the size of your map because you know you can't keep chasing them if there isn't more map, right? If they're off the map, it's just assume that they got away. But in real life, it wouldn't work that way. Again, this isn't real life. This is fantasy. So it's up to you how you play that out. The, me the <clears throat> excuse me. The next monster is the Demi Lich on page forty-eight of the Monster Manual. Now, from the lore, I believe a Demi Lich is a Lich that didn't feed souls into its phylactery. Uh, a full Lich needs souls in order to sustain its own life, death. You know, they're undead. Uh, so a demi lich is basically just their head. So it's it's a tiny it's a tiny creature. Uh, it's classified as undead. Of course, it's evil still because it's still you know the lich's head. Um, it has you know significantly less power than the lich, uh, but it's still you know a beast to fight, and they fly. As I said, the Demi Lich is a tiny undead, so it has very little strength. It has one strength point, but look how dexterous it is. It has 20 dex, so a plus 5 bonus. And the Charisma, it has a plus 5 bonus. It's resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from magic uh, weapons, uh, but it's immune to necrotic, poison, psychic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. And it has condition immunities. It can't be charmed, deafened, or, or exhausted, you know, sleeping, going for a night-night. It can't be frightened because it's it's frightening. <laughs> It'll paralyze you, petrify you, poison, prone, and stun. So, I mean, you can't do nothing to this dude. Um, his AC is 20, and that's because how small it is and how hard it is to hit. Uh, and look, it has even some skills to reflect that. Avoidance. If the Demi Lich is subjected to an effect that allows it to make a saving throw to take only half damage, it instead takes no damage if it succeeds on the saving throw, and only half damage if it fails. So, this thing, like, it's harder to kill. And then it has legendary resistance, so that if it fails the saving throw, three times a day, it's able to say, nah, I succeed. That's pretty sweet, right? Well, it could do that three times a day, but as a DM, if you want, you can make it a little bit easier on the players and give them two. Or if you want, you can make it harder and give them five. It has turn immunity, so that as it's immune to uh, effects that turn on dead. So clerics, pfft, nope. Um, and then it has a recharge of a five or a six, and where most recharges are a six for the howl ability. The demi lich emits a blood curling howl. Each creature with thirty feet of the demi lich that can hear the howl must succeed on a dc 15 con save or they drop to zero hit points immediately on a successful save the creature is frightened until the end of its next turn in fifth edition 
uh, Wizards of the Coast has gotten rid of a lot of monsters that it's like a save or suck. You either save the mechanic, you either pass it, or you fail and you're dead. That used to be in the older editions. Second edition mainly. The original, certainly. 3.5, yes, a bit. Fourth edition, I don't know. I didn't play it. In this edition, very, very rare. Okay? So, if you have a party that is really good, really has their shit together, all their magic items, and their their teamwork is phenomenal, throw some of these in. Throw some of these in. Make them go down into a sewer or something, right? Have a situation where they go down to the sewer or um, a factory or something. Maybe, yeah, maybe a factory. And have all the, the, metal, the metal ducts leading down into the factory that usually blow in the, you know, cold air or whatever or suck out the hot air. However you, well, probably blow in would be better. And then you have, uh, you know, these demi-liches come down, one demi lich come down each one and face the party. Oh, that one's for free. So in addition to all of that, even though the demi lich has an average of 80 hit points or 20 D4, um, it has a life drain ability. And anybody within, you know, up to three targets, uh, within 10 feet of it, um, they have to succeed on a con save of 19. Uh, and, or take 21, which is the average. You know, if you want to go faster, you always want to use the average because they're always, li well, almost always listed. Okay, so they take 66 necrotic damage, and the Demi-Lich regains hit points equal to the total damage dealt to all three of those targets. What else do I need to say? What else do I need to say? It has legendary actions too, but this video is getting really long. So there you go. And guess what? The Demi Lich is the only, I, I believe, let me see. Yeah, the Demi Lich is the only, the only CR 18 creature in the monster manual. So there is no bonus. That's why I spent so much time on some of these because I knew these that was coming up. And then the next one coming up is the Baylor which is the only CR-19. All right. Let's go check it out. Now, these things are a beast. They're a monster. They're a mammoth. Your party will quiver. And they've been nerfed since 3.5. You'll notice that's a common theme, right? But it's all for inclusivity, so more people will want to get into our hobby. So, all in all, I think it might be an okay thing, right? Now, I love Baylor's. The first big bad evil guy in my very first campaign back in 2002, back when I was in the Navy, when I first became a DM, was a Baylor. And his name was Saul Sunforge. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit about the story about my first campaign real quick, since this video is already long and most of you probably aren't going to make it this far. Uh, Saul Sunforge... When he got when he was defeated, the way he was defeated, they chipped his horn, right? And so so when they chipped his horn, he was cursed. He was cursed by other the you know other demons higher up than him, you know. Um, I forget was it maybe was it Jute? No, it was uh, Zug to me, I think. And um, anyway, he was cursed, and his curse was that he became a dwarf, right? So Saul Sunforge is now a dwarf. So that's why I use a lot of dwarf and stuff. I'm so wrong. I mixed up some I mixed up the stories. Actually, it was Asmodeus that the Baylor made a deal with um, in order to uh, try to get back into hell. And the deal was that either he defeated the party or um, he would get turned back he would get turned into a dwarf. That's the story. But it's an interesting dichotomy between, you know, devils and demons. You know, they made a, they had to make a pact, you know, for mutual uh, benefit and maybe mutual destruction. Now, Baylors have been nerfed considerably for 5th edition, but they still are a menace to deal with. They're still a juggernaut. They can fly double their movement speed, so they fly 80, they can, you know, move 40. They have 262 average hit points. Or 21 D12 plus 126 if you want to roll it out. They have an AC of 
19, that's their natural armor. They're strong as hell. They have a plus 8 to their strength score. They have a plus 6 to their con. They have a plus 5 to their intelligence and a plus 6 to their charisma. Their saving throws. Plus 14 to strength. Plus 12 to con. Plus 9 to wisdom. Plus 12 to charisma. So it's going to be hard to affect them with magic. They're resistant to cold, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. They're immune to fire and poison, and they're conditionally immune to poison, uh, being poisoned, since they're immune to poison. Makes sense. I, I don't know why that would need to be stated, but I, I suppose. Okay, moving on. Uh, they have a true sight out to 120 feet, which is amazing. They can see through, you know, everything. Uh, they speak abyssal and... They're telepathic. And then when a Baylor dies, they explode. And each creature within 30 feet of it must make a DC 20 deck saving throw or take 70 as the average or 20 D6 fire damage on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. The explosion ignites flammable objects in that area that aren't being worn or carried and it destroys the Baylor's weapons. They have a fire aura. At the start of each of the Baylor's turns, each creature within 5 feet of it takes 10 or 3d6 fire damage. Inflammable objects in the aura that aren't being worn or carried phew, ignite. A creature that touches the Baylor or hits it with a melee attack within 5 feet of it takes that 10 or 3d6 fire damage. Uh, the Baylor has magic uh, resistance, and so they have advantage on saving throws against magical spells and other magical effects, such as you know things from your your innate abilities or th uh, effects that your weapons may enact on most creatures. <clears throat> the Baylor has multi attack. They have two: one with a long sword and one with a a whip, uh, which is very unique. Um, their longsword has plus 14 to hit you. If your AC is 14 or less, if they don't if they do not do a critical fail, you're getting hit every single time. Can you, can, do you ha have enough mitigation as a player to defend that? That's terrifying. That is terrifying. If you're fighting one of these, you're, that means you're close to the end of your campaign. And fighting one of these before the, the end of the campaign... Meaning you're so close, but you could end the campaign right here is terrifying. And then like the last creature, the, but not quite as far, the Baylor can magically teleport along with any equipment that it may be wearing or carrying up to 120 feet to an unoccupied space it can see in the distance. Not as far as the last creature, but that's because you don't have the extra howl ability. <laughs> but the distance is the same. The last creature in this video, mostly because the other creatures were dragons, and we're going to do a separate video on dragons. You better believe we are. It's in the name of my, uh, you know, the game I play. <laughs> Although we guess we need to cover more dungeons on this channel, huh? The Pit Fiend has a natural AC of 19. It has an average of 300 hit points, or 24d10 plus 168 if you're going to roll it out. Uh, it flies double its base speed, which is 60 feet fly, 30 feet base. Uh, it has dex plus 8 for saving, a con plus 13, wisdom plus 10. Damage resistance is of cold, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons that aren't silvered. It's immune to fire and poison. Its con uh, conditional immunity is it can't be poisoned. True sight out to 120, has a passive perception of 14, so not terrible. Uh, it speaks infernal and it's telepathic. CR 20. It gives out a fear aura. Any creatures hostile to the pit fiend that starts their turn within 20 feet of the pit fiend must make a wisdom save of 21. Unless the pit fiend is incapacitated on a failed save, the creature is frightened until the start of its next turn. If a creature's saving throw is successful, the creature is immune to the pit fiend's fear aura for the next 24 hours. So, good luck. Like most high-level creatures, this one certainly has magic resistance. The Pit Fiend has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. The Pit Fiend's weapons are magical, and it has an innate spellcasting ability based off of its charisma, and it's a DC of 21. So at will, it can cast Detect Magic or Fireball. At will, it can cast Fireball. And then three times a day, it can cast Hold Monster or a wall of fire where pillars of fire emit from the ground and separate the party. Burning you too if you try to go through it. 
it lashes out with its fangs and it plus 14 to hit you it's only a five foot reach though which is good and it can only hit one target which is good it does 4d6 plus 8 which at that level isn't terrible but it's a decent it's a decent chunk <clears throat> uh the target must succeed on a dc 21 con save or become poison while poisoned this way the target can't regain hit points and it takes 6d6 poison damage at the start of each of its turns that's the part that you need to worry about holy crap the poison target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. So you better be successful. Oh my gosh, that's... Oh, I... I am so sorry. A 21 con save. Like, if you're, if you're a melee class, you have, you know, you most likely have a high con. But there's going to be certain classes that just do not, you know, uh, you know, wizards, m maybe clerics, um, sorcerers for sure, warlocks for sure, you know, like those are just aren't stats that they really build into. But it can hit you with a claw, mace, or tail. Uh, the claw does two two d eight plus eight slashing. The t mace does two d six plus eight bludgeoning plus sixty six fire damage, and the tail does three d ten plus eight. That's a, they're all plus fourteens to attack, and they're all ten foot ranges. So there you have it. There's the video. It's a, it's a lot longer than I wanted to, but I hadn't made you a video for a while. So I thought I'd give you a treat if you stayed to the end. I appreciate all of you. Have yourselves a great Halloween. <laughs> Halloween? I'm going to go as the Grim Reaper. I'm not done with this yet. I just wanted to put the mask on for you. But watch this. This is cool. Let's see. Oh, wait, I, I held it too long. Sorry. I was trying to get all that done. Oh, uh, the, the background's, uh, the background's distorting it. Hold on. Sorry. One more time. I ain't perfect. Sorry. What the heck? Did I do it in the dark last time? Ah. Uh, did you see it? Uh, hopefully you saw it. The smoke coming out of the, of, of the eye holes. <sighs> Have yourselves a great Halloween. Thanks for watching.